All right, let's get started then. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. I'm James Colgrove, and I have the honor and pleasure of serving as the Dean of the Post-Baccalaureate Pre-Medical Pre-Health Program in Columbia GS. And I'm really excited to welcome you all here today for what I'm sure is going to be a fascinating presentation by one of our program's stellar alumni. I wanna extend, first of all, a big thank you and shout out to the GS Alumni Relations team who do such a wonderful job of organizing all the great events at Reunion um, and of working with our alums all year round. Our alumni are among our greatest strengths and resources as a program. They provide invaluable mentorship and inspiration for our current students. And today's speaker, Dr. Ken Schaefel, is really a perfect example of that. Uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Schaefel and to moderate the questions, I'm very happy to turn the floor over to one of our current students, who is a leader in our student community, Margaret Crownover. Margaret is a rising second year postbac student who currently serves as the president of the Postbac Pre-Med Student Council, which is our very active student government group, which carries out a wide range of activities to improve the student experience in the postbac program. Margaret is originally from Asheville, North Carolina. She received her bachelor's degree in 2018 from Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service, where she majored in culture and politics and minored in Arabic. She worked as an immigration paralegal for two years in Washington, D.C. before uh, starting the post -back program last fall. Her choice to pursue medicine is intertwined with her belief that equitable access to health care is a human right, and she looks forward to becoming a physician who will provide excellent patient care. And in all of those respects, for all of those reasons, She's really the perfect person to introduce our speaker and to moderate the Q&A. So uh, Margaret, please take it away. Hello, thank you so much, Dean Colgrove. Um, my name is Margaret and I am the incoming postback pre-med student council president for the 21-22 academic year. And I'm honored to be introducing Dr. Schaefel. Dr. Schaefel is an assistant professor of medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and spends three months a year in Uganda working with local healthcare providers. He is the editor of Reasoning Without Resources, a 1,500-page global health te textbook published this spring by CFHI Press. Before attending Columbia University, Ken spent over a decade living in Amsterdam, where he worked with a theater company. After deciding he needed a change, a vacation to South America led him to a chance meeting with a fellow traveler who had just graduated from a post-bac pre-med program. At 35 years old and already considering making a switch into medicine, Ken decided to apply to Columbia. After completing his courses, he became a research assistant at Columbia's Vagilis College of Physicians and Surgeons Depart Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery and worked on a large database of transplant surgeries. From there, he attended Albert Einstein College of Medicine and graduated in 2014, after which he completed his internal medicine residency at Lenox Hill, where he served as chief resident of their HIV track. In 2017, Ken returned to Einstein Montefiore as a global health fellow, and in 2019, became an assistant professor of medicine. So I'm pleased to be introducing Dr. Schaefel, and I would just like to echo what um, Dean Colgrove said. I will be moderating the Q&A at the end of the session and I'm very much looking forward to it. So Dr. Schaefel, take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you, Dean Colgrove. And thank you, Columbia School of General Studies for having me back. I was a thrilled participant in the General Studies post-bac pre-med program. I loved my years there. It was hard, I completed it and it, got me where I wanted to go and I'm grateful for that every day and to this day as I practice my work in New York and Uganda. 
what I have for you today is a story that has a lot of Columbia in it because I'm going to be talking about the rise of the village health worker delivering health care in the developing world. And Columbia has been a huge advocate in research and policy on making that change happen. Moment, I'm having. Okay, a quick refresher on Africa. We've all grown up, we know the health and economic statistics are dire. 10% of the world's population carrying 25% of the burden of disease in the world measured by life years and ability lost. And with 75% of the world's HIV cases in sub-Saharan Africa, yet only 3% of the world's healthcare workforce. And ironically and tragically, Africa loses many of its own physicians every year who are offered higher paying jobs overseas, struggling desperately to meet the burden of disease in Africa. This comment from Colombian Jeff Sachs is the centerpiece of this presentation today. The greatest revolution in public health today is the rise of the professionalized community health worker. The operative word in the sentence is professionalized. Um, and I want to say the term community health worker and village health worker are interchangeable. Community health workers originated in China in the 1950s during the Great Leaps Forward when lay persons were deputized by local health commissioners to deliver rudimentary health care and education on the village level. This was successful for 20 years, and by the 1970s, American doctors were studying this model of care delivery. And in the first global convention of health and human rights, Alma Ata in 1978, they identified community health workers to be a part of the solution for global health care going forward. For the next 20 years, community health workers occupied a sort of volunteer type space in the healthcare continuum. They were outside of formal systems. They were unpaid, they had minimal resources to work with, and it was thought that their role was primarily one of education and counseling, and it was an honor position to serve in their community. Occasionally they were paid in gifts. The one key thing you must understand about them is that they were elected by their community to serve and they could and would only serve their immediate geographic area. So it was a, not a job that you might take and do somewhere else. It was a local position. This began to change in 2008 when the world's leading health and economic organizations jointly declared a set of eight goals to be accomplished in the next 15 years. And for the first time on a wide global level, funding was set forward to achieve these goals. Now, if you look at the eight goals, you'll notice that four of them are in the realm of health and nutrition. This is what we call primary care medicine. Primary care is exactly what the developing world does not have. It has a hospital-based medicine system where one comes to the hospital during the course of an illness for episodic care. You leave when, you, when you're well and you don't come back till you're sick again. There is almost nothing in the developing world due to the lack of resources and lack of staff of screening, ongoing well checkups or management of chronic diseases like hypertension, diabetes, asthma, and epilepsy. These goals focused on exactly what really wasn't happening at scale in the developing world. To achieve these goals, several countries, Ethiopia, India, and several in South America looked to the village health worker sector to scale that up, to train them up to a higher level and use them basically to achieve delivery of primary care. And it was successful. Through the 15 years of implementing and measuring those goals, the role of CHWs evolved. They became paid. They became trained at a higher level. Pretty much all of primary care was offloaded to them and they began to be considered a subsystem adjacent to the formal hospital medical system. Jeff Sachs of Columbia summed up this transition in 2013. This was after a, a seminar at Columbia in 2011, where they looked at the issue of 
how to push, drive, and support the scaling up of village health workers. They had this seminar, and in this 2013 Lancet paper, he said the key difference is that the workers are now viewed as integral and formally part of the health system with reporting, training, super, supervision, and feedback. They took this proposal to the WHO and it was embraced as the best path forward for healthcare in the developing world. I'd like to tell you how this evolved specifically in the program I'm involved with. I'm, with, I'm involved with what's been a 16 year partnership with a small governmental hospital in Uganda where some faculty and staff from Einstein work with over 100 Ugandans to increase healthcare delivery in their area. A bit about Uganda, it's, it's there in the middle, roughly where Wyoming and Colorado would be on the US. Like most of Africa, it's in the bottom 10% of all health and economic indices population of 46 million, it's slightly smaller than France or Germany. Geographically, it's two times the size of New York State. The area I work in is this little red tip here, nestled between Rwanda and Congo. It is the rural, the ruralist district of Kisoro, you may call it the Appalachia of Uganda. Tremendous shortage of healthcare workers. You're gonna meet three people in Uganda colleagues in Kosoro who are making this massive change from the volunteer, they've made the change already from the volunteer unpaid village health workers to the professional or paraprofessional village health workers. We've got Elois Habamana who supervises village health workers in the field, Mary Niramatuzo, who is a village health worker for 15 years, and Abel Neonzima who um, supervises other village health worker driven programs in the field. I'm about to go into the first video, but I need to clarify two terms that will be used. DGH is an acronym for Doctors for Global Health. It's the NGO our Einstein faculty group uh, is part of in order to facilitate the uh, financial and legal aspects of our work in Uganda. And Einstein is the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx. So now I'll take you to the first video which is Alois telling you about a day in his life and the work he does. My name is Habiman Alois. Uh, I'm a clinical officer. I work as a clinical provider. And uh, I work with the DJ Einstein uh, Vegetable Program Project. I've been in the same project for two years now. Uh, today we are going to have uh, a, a village health worker supervision and it is under a, VH, a VHW project program that is based in the villages community. Uh, we have uh, 51 village health workers in uh, 51 villages and each of them get, has uh, two supervision days in a month. Uh, supervision is necessary because uh, we go out to see uh, what the VHWs are doing in their respective villages because they were trained uh, to treat acute and identify chronic illnesses. So whenever we reach their villages, they, uh, we verify or we validate what they have already done in two weeks. Every after two weeks, they have what they have done. They have treated acute illnesses and identified chronic illnesses as well. So for the acute illnesses, they are treated and we go there to see how they are doing. For the chronic illnesses, we, uh, we visit respective people for them to be enrolled in the program if they qualify. Yeah, I enjoy uh, my work because I become able to treat and manage people in the villages who need health service, and that makes me happy. Yes, work. You know, we should be here to work and cover more village. 
abo nabantu barankunze mu village mu byubuzima ndi kubakorerana cyane kubahereza madagara umvaga nishimye cyane kuvuga ngo y'Imana igumishe kundeka mu bya village hereso waka ya when umva nishimye umurimo kandi nabantu 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 urage banje baranyishimye cyane kugira ngo umuze kubakorera The information on each of the pages in the family sheet binder that she's having is uh, it concerns the uh, all the health information in different villages in different homes each home has a sheet whereby all the information concerning health was is documented for example if any family it has a number of family members it has uh, the health status of the family members if for any family member who has a chronic illness, it is indicated for any uh, family item that is missing concerning health, like a toilet, a latrine, or an animal house, it is present. And for any member, like for any uh, desire of the family concerning uh, health talk that they need, it is also, it is also shown. So the, these are drugs I have brought to the field for the vegetables as they usually have the drugs which they use in treating acute illnesses. So when we come, we, they have a stock card where we count to sell many fields they are remaining with and to see whether we are supposed to refill for them. If they have got finished, you have to add them. Uh, we came to this house to uh, to check on the child that was treated by the village health worker, Mary. After the child presented with the uh, difficulty in breathing and cough with the fever, so she treated in money, and we had to check on how the child is doing. Yeah, every time we reach W treats, uh, we uh, we recheck whenever we come for supervision. We we'll check for we we'll check the people that she has tried to treat on how they are doing. Today the child is doing well, as in he has no cough, is not breathing fast, has no fever, and on exam the lungs are clear. Well, during supervision day, we cross check on the treatment guideline that we are given to respective village health workers to see or check if they treated rightly and where they did not do right uh, treat right we guide them on how they are, they are supposed to treat Sarkozy, we're going to go. 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 We're going
kuri wewe kisoje ni ile bitu se nyirebye ni nziza uyu munsi uko murebye ibyo nashize ku stipend uko ndiko ngenda mu magondi kuba fashion ko yareze mandagara mbonye ari byiza kujyana namwe ibafashe kumenya ko ndi gukora mishizeho umwete the day has been very good as in we found when the which the video has taken care of his people very many of them as in she had treated the eight patients at the illnesses and he had one hospital discharge was discharged from hospital so she had to follow up that patient she also identified the two chronic illnesses uh, who were both asthmatic patients she had one mentally ill patient identified uh, she also had the uh, uh, three new pregnancies that she identified in her village she has uh, she identified the uh, five uh, uh, people or pregnant women who attended antenatal. There are five, uh, so she had to refer them for antenatal, five of them. Uh, I'm seeing uh, she didn't have uh, a woman referred for cervical cancer screening, but she had the one uh, referred for family planning and identified the four homes with the uh, risk, uh, risk factors from her family sheet binder. Yeah. So those are the items she had. In addition to the home talks that she gave, she gave four home talks to different homes and different home talks. One was on diarrhea, another on cervical cancer, another on, on malaria, the other one was on hypertension. Yeah. Yeah, for four ups, she had the uh, eight four ups she had. Some of them are asthmatic patients, at failure, and the hypertensive are not controlled at CD comb that she tries to follow up to see how they are taking meds and how their measures are doing. Yeah, so those are the activities she had to do in the last two weeks. Okay, that's the first video. Um, I think it's pretty clear that she is a one woman force of nature. She and other village health workers like her are massively effective clinical technicians operating there in their village. Go on with the presentation. I need to take a moment and identify the demographic issues in Uganda. In the United States, this is what our population distribution looks like. There's roughly even numbers of people in each age bracket until we reach the age of 65 when age-related mortality sets in and there's a felt relatively stable loss of the older population. Uganda is totally different. Due to a high birth rate, the population is enormously clustered in the lower age tiers. In fact, 75% of the population is under the age of 25. That means an enormous amount of women are in peak childbearing years or are entering into peak childbearing years and an enormous number of babies are being born. Therefore, one of the first health issues that must be addressed on a societal scale in Uganda is maternal and fetal health. So I'd like to walk you through the origins of our program, how we scaled out delivery of our services starting in 2005. The first place we went was on the wards of the hospital itself. Due to a tremendous physician shortage, we put ourselves, attending physicians from Montefiore and our third year residents on the wards for a month at a time, literally for direct staff support. And we directly supported the hospital. We bought mattresses for the beds, we bought x-ray film, just acute support for the hospital. Once that was stabilized, we the very next thing we did was start a VHW program in 20 villages and start what's called a chronic care clinic. You'll see more of that later, which is for hospital discharged. 
discharges. I mentioned there's no primary care in Africa. So you might be discharged from the hospital with high blood pressure and two weeks worth of medication and no follow-up ever. That doesn't work. And we started a malnutrition program right away in 2006 because of the enormous number of children in the malnutrition age group. And then in 2007, we started a dedicated women's clinic, the first of its kind in Uganda with cervical cancer screening, antenatal care, well woman checkups, breast cancer screening. So we followed the acute need and the demographic in the delivery of our services. 2009, we doubled the number of villages served by village health workers. And we took the women's health services on the road with literally an ambulance loaded with equipment. And we'd go to remote health centers um, on a once a week basis and do cervical cancer screening uh, in areas that were so far from our own base of operations that the women would never be able to get there. Okay, next I'm going to address another one of our clinical supervisors, his Abel Neonzima. He works on a different level. He is responsible for a census. We administer a giant census every two years because to know what we're doing, we have to speak in inventory the health conditions of the people. So every two years we do a, not a population census, a health census. And we, he also runs a program called Chronic Care in the Community, which is responsible for delivering medications to people in their village to save them the trip to the hospital, to pick up meds. Um, first, Abel is gonna explain the census work that he does. I'm Ebo Nionzima. I'm a clinical supervisor. I've worked for DGH uh, since 2015. I've been working as a VHW supervisor, a CCC clinical supervisor, a, a clinical provider, a CDCOM clinical provider. And I'm in charge of CDCOM and nutrition in the community. And during census, uh, the clinical provider or the staff from KDH goes to the village, works with the VHW, walking into the village, visiting house to house, asking uh, different questions in relation to health. In this kind of interview during census, they also do practical part of it. With the help of the VHW, they screen the Children under five years, they check their mark to assess for malnutrition. Then for other older people in the house, they check their BP. And in this kind of process, they ask if anybody in the house has ever had any other chronic disease. And in this kind of uh, uh, process, they have identified uh, new chronic diseases through this activity, and most of them are under our care. Okay, so with, with having a health census and with using the mechanism of door-to-door -door visits across 9,000 households, we finally tipped into the realm of finding sick people rather than waiting for them to present to the hospital. Now primary care is on and we're doing it. And we get the data every two years to manage and plan our decisions um, and our programs going forward. Now the other program ABL runs is called CDCOM, Chronic Disease in the Community. There's a tremendous need to deliver healthcare into the villages where people live because the roads are so bad, the distances are far, transport's expensive, and these are subsistence farmers 
who literally make survival and priority decisions every day with the one to two dollars they earn as subsistence farmers. They might not have two dollars to take a motorcycle taxi once a month to the hospital to pick up high blood pressure medicine. Due to low health literacy and other competing priorities, that's not a deal they'll make. So we bring the medicine and the screening and the counseling and the checkups to them in the village, CDCOM. We started CDCOM in 2011, the same year that we started doing the census. It was the next branch of service we built out. Uh, what's in the book? And now I'm trying to prepare myself for the activity. I'm loading a CD com binder which has the uh, patient uh, records for for the whole uh, time since enrollment and the up to date. Uh, this uh, then I'm having also medications for all the patients that I will see today. Um, I load them. Yeah, so we have arrived at the site of CDCOM. Uh, at CDCOM, we find a VHW trying to do some activities, uh, checking uh, patients' measurements. And this village, uh, the VH, a village health worker has the 30 active patients. And uh, because of COVID-19, we also try to practice social distance. You can see how pa our patients are seated. So we laid the strategy of not inviting all the Sate patients to come at the meeting point. And we, we together with the VHW, uh, we decided to identify those who should not necessarily come at the meeting point. So out of the Sate, we expect to meet 17 and the 13 uh, to be visited by the VHW. So as we can see, we have uh, now um, around 11 patients out of the 17. She's telling me some of the, uh, the patients came in here early and she took measures. They left because they had other commitments around here in the village. Um, so VHW does the work of checking disease measures. She has CDCOM forms. Uh, similar record is to what I have. She has a record at the village level and we also have record at the hospital. Um, after she checks the patients, uh, she, will represent, she will present the patients to me. Where measures make alarm, I repeat the check. And um, uh, if need arises, we do the possible medication changes as well.
has 30 patients. Uh, out of 30, 17 uh, were expected to come. Uh, two of the 17 missed, the absent. And then the 13, she, delivered, she will deliver to them and get me disease measures. I've got the disease measures for the 13 for previous months. So each patient she, she sees, she gets an incentive of at least 750. And out of the 30, she earns something from 28, which is making um, 21,000. Okay, so you saw Abel and the village health worker using a pen and ink system. But that system combined with the census system is good enough to capture data. And it's achievable. We're not using smartphones. We can't afford them. There's just a couple guys sitting on a couple of secondhand laptops who crunch this data once a month. But it gets the job done. As we expanded our services, 2012, we added mental health services. We funded a nurse to be trained and retained at the hospital. And then we started a motorcycle follow-up. Couple guys who ride out to the villages and find people who missed their follow-up appointments to say, hey, your epilepsy did not go away. Come see us. Or hey, you're an insulin injecting diabetic. You cannot stay away from the doctor for six months. In 2013, we added a cardiac surgery program. The, Me the Hofstra Medical School uh, joined on with us. In 2014, we expanded VHW coverage to 52 villages. In 2016, we expanded our data work to create dedicated family health sheets as the coin of the realm, as the fundamental unit of record keeping standardized to all village health workers. Globally, by 2018, village health workers were the health program of choice in many countries. Tens of thousands of village health workers added to be a formal recognized part of the healthcare delivery system. And in October 2018, the World Health Organization revised and rewrote the code for using village health workers and gave um, whole new principles recognizing their professional status in the healthcare system. And in 2018, Africa looked back at the 1 million village health workers that had been proposed in 2013. They said, we want 2 million. And this is the statement from the collective of 65 African nations. Few, if any, of our health and deliver development tools match the potential of community health workers to drive gains on multiple fronts. It is evidence-based. One more quote, community health worker programs also represent good jobs, bolster national and local economies and increase productivity by improving health and well-being. I'll add two things to that. Good jobs for women. OK, and that's essential because it allows women who need health services to access them from another woman, likely a woman who's had multiple children herself in the same immediate regional area. So they can really speak realistically about childbearing. That's not the option if the doctor, the woman has to wait to see is a government assigned MD from another region of the country. The other thing I wanted to say is that um, one of the early Millennium Development Goals was empowerment of women. And this is achieving that through a secondary intention. I want to go through a little bit more of our program's uh, evolution. In 2017, we added the geriatrics project to address the unmet needs of the elderly in these villages. Now, I want to change the, time, the name of this from our timeline to our development. And our development is based on people, based on these people. I want you to get, and I hope you have gotten, how skilled these people are. And that coming from a low resource country does not mean you're a low ability person. These people are phenomenally effective. And if they were here in our country, we would call them colleague, manager, boss, and department chairperson. The means we use in Uganda are a pen and ink system. 
we use a cardboard box, but a carefully planned cardboard box stocked in advance. Now, they use motorcycles to show up. The methods of management used in our program are fundamentally solid. You supervise, you plan, you do a test, you check the results, you modify. You check, check, and double check. And you do a census every two years to find out if what you're doing is reaching appropriately to the people you're trying to serve. Everything was going along until this surprise came across our path. It caused all of the American staff to leave by July of 2020. Could VHWs handle or contribute during the unexpected arrival of COVID in Uganda? Well, the clue to the answer being yes is that during prior Ebola outbreaks in 2014, in other African countries, VHWs were essential to the track, trace, and public education method. In our group, we crash wrote a home talk on coronavirus. We trained all 52 village health workers how to give it. They did teach back with field observation, socially distanced. And finally, they went out and delivered the talks. We gave 4,000 COVID home talks in three months to a total of 14,000 adults, including pre and post comprehension tests, demonstrating um, that they did have increased knowledge, notably in the areas of asymptomatic spread and effective preventive methods. I bring this example to you to demonstrate that when you have an effective health system built, it can take a new challenge. It can pivot, just like the healthcare systems in the US pivoted to address the needs of COVID. Because there was a system on the ground with experienced people used to working together with attack supervision, this could be handled. And the biggest harm was people who needed health care staying away from health systems because they didn't want to get COVID. We educated people, and then we increased our village delivery of services in order to have people not miss medication or treatment. If you have a system, it can be adapted. The affordable, effective system for Africa is the village health care worker system. Every year, we're rising up what they do, what they can be trained to do, and the skills they have, and the effect they're having is immeasurable. That concludes my prepared remarks. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks again to Columbia School of General Studies for having me back as a presenter today. It's an honor to be part of the Reunion Week events. Um, I'm happy now to take any questions. Um, I think Margaret's going to be uh, taking questions from the group, either from the chat or through uh, through a through the video. So I'll just say thank you very much, and I'll be ready for your questions. Thank you, Dr. Schaefel. That was a wonderful presentation, very inspiring. And we're already getting some questions um, in the chat. The first one that I see is um, whether you could comment on how the Millennium Development Goals. Are not that are not explicitly labeled as health related, such as primary education and gender equality, influence health outcomes. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I think I'll have to go back to, to those. Um, what I what I would say is um it seems to me the biggest question I'd raise is one of plugging in of villages village, and we're going to speak on the unit of families because that's the functional unit in in, in the, all of the world but in the developing world where decisions are made there are families that that stay away from education and health care because it's something other it's systemic it's from the government it's too expensive and if those families can be connected it kind of opens up many things um when the children gain literacy, it's an advantage for the whole family. And when the parents start going for screening, you know, people live longer. When we, when nutrition gets delivered, um, it relieves stunting in children. I, I feel they all work together. Um, and that it's, it's largely a question of having people access resources as almost a, a gestalt decision on the basis of the family's 
way it relates to larger society. So all the Millennium Development Goals will cause benefits across all spectrums of health and economics and survival. Wow. Um, wow, that's amazing. I mean, I fully agree with that. And um, going off of that, there's another question from Joe that says, you talked a lot about cervical cancer screening in the women in these remote villages. If it turns out that a woman has a malignancy, is it feasible for them to travel the 10 hours up to Kampala and stay there for a month or two to get radiotherapy? Well, it depends on the size of the malignancy, of course. Remember, you can detect small early neoplasms that can be treated with cryotherapy right on the spot or leap. Mm -hmm. and, and they actually bring that equipment, including a, nitro, a nitrogen tank with them. The smaller lesions, are, are treated and taken care of, and then the woman remains in surveillance. Larger lesions are biopsied there on the spot, and based on the pathology, um, they are referred, they go to further services. And, and what, when we first started cervical cancer screening in 2007, we found a lot of advanced neoplasms, and it was terrible, and there was high mortality, which was gonna happen anyway, because they were already set up. What happens now is with routine screening, things are caught much earlier, and there's relatively few cases that would need to go to a, um, a referral hospital. So few that we can financially support the women who need to do that. And the answer isn't only Kampala. Uh, in our case, we use Embarara, which is about 80 kilometers from where we are. So okay. um, because things are caught earlier, the costs are kept down, allowing you know the big spends to be relatively infrequent. So yeah, we, I mean, if you're asking the question, are we able to do something with what we find, the answer is yes. Wow. Um, and how has this work in Uganda informed your practice in the United States, if it has? Of course, it, it totally has. Um, it's allowed my heart to break more easily and more often wherever I am, because mm -hmm. I recognize the same patterns of inequality I find when I first went to Africa, it was very exotic. And the more I go, the more I realize it's just intensities of the same colors and that there's such a thin septum that divides the developing world from our practices here. I, I just recognize injustice and imbalance so much quicker because I'm used to seeing it in such florid manifestations over there. I, I recognize it here more quickly. That said, I don't mean to say my heart is broken, my heart is stronger because it's exercise. And every day in global health, you have to reconstitute yourself with love and commitment and go forward. And I'm constantly being amazed by my African colleagues and patients with who they are and what they face. And that certainly changes the threshold in my life for being irritated or discouraged or having a, a bad word to say or think. Um, one last thing I'll say about that is when I first went to Uganda as a medical student, I was a little bit burned out on US healthcare. It was so expensive and used so many resources. And then I was um, two months in a hospital where you couldn't get an ABG, you couldn't get an X-ray, you couldn't get there, you know, you couldn't get almost anything. And I came back to the US hospitals and I'm like, we're given this to work with? <laughs> I'm going to be the best doctor ever because now it's like being given a space station. Yeah. Wow. Your commitment and like the impact that this work has had on you and that you have had on the patients you work with is truly inspiring. Um, how has your experience in Uganda impacted your understanding of cultural competency and the necessity of that? You know, it's funny. I have come to find so much more common ground amongst people. I, I, we work with translators there. Let me get that completely out of the gate. We have a year round staff of translators who are very adept uh, both in English and with cultural issues. But through translators, I find myself connecting and laughing with Ugandan grandmothers who are illiterate and, you know, grow up with goats in their hut. You know, you'd think I have nothing in common with them, but 
human beings can laugh and smile and show patience. Like when I have to tell someone like, I need to repeat this test because we ran out of chemicals down in the lab and I need to draw your blood again. People get that. And again, the, the level of exoticness is, is decreasing in my life. I'm, I'm more now to presume I will be able to establish a relationship, connection and understanding with the human being. And that's not from excessively front loading myself with a memorization of their unique cultural features. It's by first extending myself to them, honestly, as a human being, one step at a time um, with respect um, making sure understandings develop appropriately, that they know what I'm trying to do and I understand what their concerns are. I believe a, a bridge like that of mind and heart um, kind of obviates other concerns. And I, we do rely on our translators very heavily for issues of cultural sensitivity. For example, I'll just give you one that comes up like, a, a young woman arrives with her mother and she's say in her early teens and she's got a, a vaginal complaint and I need to ask her if she's sexually active but her mother's there and we're in a highly Christian country with super traditional values. So in that moment, I actually turn to my translator and I say, yo, this is, I, I gotta ask this. And then the translator will perhaps ask the mother to step away for a moment or uh, you know, will help guide me through that. So I do use an awareness that I, I might be out of my depth at times and you know, phone a friend. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I, I'm in awe of your work and as I'm sure the rest of the audience is. And I just wanna thank you again for, for giving us this amazing and inspiring presentation. And I just wanted to see if you have any final words before we um, finish up. Um, well, maybe just two. One about Africa, a point I, I, I want to convey for understanding the healthcare problems in Africa is how severe the brain drain issue is. Um, and, all, and this is across the African continent that um, most of the medical schools are government funded but the world is so short on doctors. America imports over 50,000 doctors a year from around the world, and they're not coming from richer nations. And that, um, and that demand is not gonna slow from developing countries as our population ages. So there's a weird paradox where yes, Africa needs more doctors, but it's such a risky spend for Africa to put a person all the way through medical school and the training afterwards is then they've got all of a sudden one of the most mobile and economically valuable degrees in the world and so many leave and who, who am I to say I wouldn't take such a decision for my family if I could benefit them but it's an odd thing where yes they need doctors but it's not the first most essential priority to build a bunch more medical schools because that might not get them a return on investment. Right. Um, and the second thing is about the, the Columbia Postback program. I, I found it a wonderful program, so valid in terms of what it trained me for. And I also want to always thank the program for giving me a chance. My background was in theater, technical theater with sound, uh, sound and lighting for bands and theaters for 20 years uh, for the full length of it. And that literally plays in my life every day, like two months ago when my boss told me that he wanted videos of every program we were doing in Africa. And I could simply say, yeah, I can do that. I know how to do it. Um, and then to execute that on a deadline. So I just find that being an older student who I bring other things to the table in my medical work, it's an asset being an older student with an additional background of experience. Um, so I, that's my message from where I stand. Yeah, I mean, as someone in the postdoc program currently, I have just met so many people from all walks of life. And it's really interesting and inspiring to see the work that people go into, like your combination of um, theater and going to Uganda to care for patients 
who don't have access to healthcare is amazing. And it's not, I guess, a traditional track, um, which is one of the best things about GS. So I believe we have to wrap up. I wanna say thank you again, Dr. Schaefel. This was a, a truly inspiring presentation. And I want to encourage um, all attendees to come to more events throughout the week. I believe the reunion goes through early June. So yeah, and please feel free to reach out and Dr. Schaefel's contact information is on this slide as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.